Welcome everyone. We got a full house tonight, braving the weather um, to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Spring Hill USD 230 Board of Education. Um, Rachel, collect the roll. Mrs. Horn? Here. Mr. Chitwood? Here. Mrs. Melius? Here. Mr. Ewing? Mrs. Mitchell? Here. Mr. Hull? Here. Mrs. Baker? Here. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we'd like to start, um, well, we kind of started already, but we'd like always like to read our vision and mission statements just to remind us of what we're here for. So um, the mission of the USD 230 school district is to be a school district that engages students to learn, create, adapt, and succeed in an ever-changing world. And our vision statement is to maintain small town values and empower each student to achieve world-class success. So we'll keep that in mind as we proceed. Um, our next item of business is business with individuals. No cards were presented. Okay. Uh, Madam President, could I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. We have we need a second for that. We okay. got out of order a little bit. I'll second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? Okay. Rachel, will you please collect the vote? Mr. Chitwood? Yes. Mrs. Melius? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Hull? Yes. Mrs. Baker? Yes. Mrs. Horn? Yes. Approved. Great. Thanks. We'll we'll name you parliamentarian. Keep it you'll keep us on track. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> okay, our next um item of business is a consent agenda, which consists of approval of the consent agenda items. Approval of the minutes, the clerk's report, payroll and claims, treasurer's report, personnel, um, KSB membership, a special services contract, and I believe that is it. Okay, Madam President, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Okay, we have a motion. For second. And a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, Rachel, would you please collect the vote? Mrs. Melius? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Hull? Yes. Mrs. Baker? Yes. Mrs. Horn? Yes. Mr. Chitwood? Yes. Approved. Okay, moving on to um, good news, recognitions, and announcements. Dr. Latrell? Yes, we have uh, some good news announcements and recognitions for uh, for this month, and we're good. And we're going to start out with our uh, some we have some core value uh, award presentations this evening that our uh, early learning academy uh, principal Mrs. Stephanie Barnhill is uh, going to uh, come and share with you some information about the individuals and what category specifically of our five core values that she is recognizing uh, each individual. In, but I will steal a little bit of the surprise. Typically, they're student success, which is, of course, our number one core value that should always be at the forefront. And the other area that she will be recognizing individuals on is in the area of supportive environment. So, uh, Mrs. Barnhill, I will turn it over to you at this point. Thank you. Good evening. It's my privilege to recognize three teachers and three paraprofessionals who have served the Spring Hill Early Childhood Program for a combined total of 74 years. First, I'd like to recognize the teachers. Laura Hines started out as a paraprofessional. She was a paraprofessional in the program for five years. And then um, she received her degree and her licensure and she's been working with the Early Childhood Program for 10 years. Jennifer Schmidtberger has been working with this program for 12 years. And Heather Thompson has been working with us for seven years. 
These ladies have seen many changes throughout their years in Spring Hill, and they have been an integral part of creating the program we have today. Five teachers moved the early childhood program to the new facility in December of 2019. These three ladies remained with the program, playing a major role in planning for the on-site classes as we reopened during the pandemic. Laura, Jennifer, and Heather continually exceed expectations and are gifted in creating new and engaging learning experiences for all of our students. Their dedication to ensuring all our young scholars succeed is phenomenal. And I'd like to recognize them for student success. Picture, picture. Do you want in front yeah, of the we'll USD we'll we'll Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next, I'd like to recognize three dedicated paraprofessionals whose stories are very similar to the teachers. They too have been through many changes throughout the years and continue to step up to each new opportunity to create unique learning experiences for our young scholars. Lindsay Yoder has been with the program for 12 years. Crystal O'Neill has been a para with us for five years. And Kelly King has been a part of the early childhood program for 23 years. I just have to share one story about Kelly. She came to me this afternoon and she was saying, you know, I got to share this memory with you. Um, she had, had a daycare of her own and she closed the daycare and she wanted to work outside the home. So she heard that the school district was in need of some paraprofessionals and she decided to apply thinking that she'd give it a year or two and see how it went. Well, 23 years later, Kelly is still supporting students in the classroom and we are fortunate to have her. Kelly, Lindsay and Crystal start and end each day with a smile, always ready to do whatever it takes to support the students and help them grow and learn. And without them, the program wouldn't be what it is and I couldn't do the job that I do. So I thank the, all these ladies very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. Again, congratulations to all those individuals. We do strive to, uh, through our each academic school year, recognize individuals that we uh, it is felt exemplify the any one of the five core values, and they can be individuals can be nominated uh, by anyone. They do not have to be a staff person. They can be a community member uh, as well. So. Again, keep that in mind because, again, we're going to keep uh, continuing to do that for the uh, worthy individuals. Uh, a couple more items on the good news. Wanted to give a shout out to uh, uh, a junior from Spring Hill High School, Ava Rushing. Uh, she designed recently the uh, through our wellness program, the Spring Hill on the Move uh, T-shirt. And I think they're going to put that up there on display now. So uh, Miss Hackney, who kind of oh, oversees our wellness program, was going to 
talk a little bit about it. So Spring Hill on the Move has been part of our employee wellness for well over 15 years. And during the last eight years, we have begun doing a client connected projects with our high school. So we were doing client connected projects before they were a thing. <laughs> so this year's winner is Ava Rushing. Ava is a junior at Spring Hill High School. I was visiting with her before we began. She is planning on going into marketing and advertising. She takes lots of art classes at Spring Hill High School, uh, doing a lot of great things with the theater department. She's joined by one of her teachers, Miss Hapke, who worked with our wellness committee on this client connected project. For our Spring Hill on the Move, our wellness committee comes up with a theme. We brainstorm lots of different themes and you can tell it's a little Taylor Swift, Ode to Taylor Swift, um, but we love Ava's uh, drawing. Uh, oftentimes when we do have submissions from students, we have them make a lot of tweaks, and I don't believe any revisions were asked at all because it was just so awesome to begin with. So as a token from our wellness committee, Ava gets a little gift card for her fine work and her efforts, and Ava, do you want to say anything or any questions for Ava? Hi. <laughs> Any questions for Ava? Okay, well, again, very, we thank you very much. Thank you. And you can also, uh, one time a month, we have each of our schools uh, submit some of the highlights from the previous month. And for the month of March, you do have the uh, building highlights that were presented. You can review those. I'm sure you already have. And then to wrap up our good news, recognitions, and announcements this evening, uh, it's the one time a month where we also do a video that kind of highlights what's going well at one of our attendance centers. And this evening, we're going to see a brief highlight video on what's going well at Prairie Creek Elementary School. Things that are going well here at Prairie Creek include a change in our master schedule this year. So we have an intense focus around PLCs and something that we call win time, which is what I need time. During that time, students get instruction at the level that they need. So that may mean enrichment, that may mean extra support, um, but all students in a grade level are going all over to different classrooms, different teachers, different support staff in order to get what they need in instruction. We've got some really fun spring performances that we, so we've done a couple and we're having a couple coming up. So kindergarten did a really cute show with animals. The fourth grade's doing one called summer camp very soon. Um, so all kinds of fun with that. And some of the grades that already have performances, we're doing just other random fun things. We are able to feed a lot of kids during the day. So we offer fresh breakfasts, fresh lunches, lots of fruits and veggies, rainbows of color. One thing that is going great is the way that we are really finding the leaders in our students and we are recognizing them monthly at a leadership assembly that we call our habit hero assembly. It's encouraged other students to really use those habits and find a way that they can be leaders. Our staff and our teachers here at Prairie Creek are incredible. They're very supportive and it's like we're all family here at Prairie Creek and that's what I love. We've done a few different activities school-wide and they've gotten the kids involved and it just seems like everybody's engaged and everybody's excited about it. Yeah, and thank you for that. And again, that's uh, completes this month's good news, recognitions, and announcements. Looked like a couple people were wearing those t-shirts too in the video. So that's good, good thing there. Okay, uh, moving on to action items. Um, the first 8.01 is um, teaching and learning curriculum purchase. Dr. Latrell? Yes, uh, we have our teaching and learning department, uh, Dr. Smith, as you know, has been uh, briefing us for several months on some of the materials that uh, are up for purchase for adoption for the start of our 24-25 uh, school year. And some of those included some textbooks, which again, you know, we try to do try to do some small pilots with some of our staff before we make a final decision.
to make sure that we, you know, kind of see what kinks might be involved. So Dr. Smith's going to kind of real uh, walk you through that portion of what we're asking for on the first two items of curriculum purchase as well as the pilots. Good evening. For item 8.01, the purchase is a renewal of tools that we've had within the district since the fall of 2020. The first is a product called Formative. It's an assessment platform that's used in grades 6 through 12. It allows teachers to create quizzes, uh, analyze the data as students complete those quizzes, and then adjust instruction accordingly. And it's used uh, primarily by our professional learning communities. So that's a, a tool that they've been using since the fall of 2020, as is a product called Make Music. This is used by our secondary music teachers. So that would include your band teachers, your orchestra, your vocal music teachers. And it allows students to uh, have an opportunity to do some practice with their different performance pieces as they prepare for uh, live performances and music competitions. So these are digital tools that we are asking the board to approve the renewal of these uh, products. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Smith about these two renewals? I think the only thing, and it's maybe for Doug, but it's obviously budgeted, right? It's in the budget. Yeah. All right, cool. Madam President, I'm going to try to do something a little crazy here. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to uh, move to approve 8.01 and 8.02 as presented. Okay, so we haven't, does anybody have any questions? Oh, okay, let's go ahead and let the motion go. Is there a second? Okay, I thought we already talked about 8.02. Well, we can still ask questions after the second. So if you still have questions and then before Did you we go, cover eight? Oh, well, so. we haven't been able to ask questions, but we covered it in discussion at the last meeting. So yeah, and I think Dr. Latrell introduced it a little bit just by saying that 8.02 are the proposed textbooks that we would like to pilot in April and May of this uh, spring semester. And those pilot products um, that we're proposing, those have all gone through our procedures uh, for the selection of instructional materials. So all of the uh, information provided on board docs comes from our three different committees, our teacher selection team, the education advisory council, and we held an event for public participation for anyone in the community that wanted to provide feedback. So we received really positive feedback from all three groups. So we're just asking for the board to approve these textbooks for piloting in the spring semester. Yeah, I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Now, is there any discussion or any questions? Okay, seeing none, um, Rachel, would you please collect the vote? Mr. Ewing? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Hull? Yes. Mrs. Baker? Yes. Mrs. Horn? Yes. Mr. Chitwood? Yes. Mrs. Milius? Yes. Approved. Okay. Uh, moving on to Spring Hill Schools Summer Maintenance Projects, Dr. Luttrell or Kylie? Yes, uh, Mr. Delphi is making his way up. And again, as we talked at our last meeting, summer projects coming up and we try to do a lot of our main major projects. We had some this year that we're looking at in terms of uh, some pavement projects and flooring projects. And we did get some cost, cost uh, estimates in. Of course, we do try to use uh, the state contract uh, that already pretty much guarantees us the best price for the project we're doing. But I'll let turn that over to Kylie. Good evening. Yep. Mm -hmm. This was a discussion item on the last board meeting. Um, I've got three projects here, Spring Hill Middle School Flooring Project, Spring Hill Elementary School Flooring Project, and the Prairie Creek and Spring Hill High School Pavement Project. And everything I think is pretty well, pretty clear there. Um, and I'll stand for any questions. One thing I do want to comment, Kylie, on the uh, one thing that I think is very uh, ideal to point out is that when we went into planning these projects back in the fall and uh, Mr. Delphia spent quite a bit of time just kind of uh, trying to figure, okay, what cost proposal, would, what cost estimate would likely we get on some of these projects? And, of course, you see the big one there is our payment project, and a lot of that is based upon, of course, 
the cost, there's a lot of oil that go, you know, so you got to look at the cost of that, but that project there did come in. We were pretty pleased with that cost. Yes, we were. It was estimated over a million dollars, uh, back when we first started looking at it. So when we got these numbers, we, we were very pleased. So. Um, a lot of money. Okay. So does anybody have any questions for Kylie? Any further questions? Sure. Kylie, what, mm -hmm. um, as anyone knows, this high school is almost, the parking lot looks like it's almost in session, school's in session during the summer with kids coming and going. What's the plan to make sure there's still parking spots for them? Yeah. So we're going to have to do that in phases. So We'll do one. We haven't talked to the contractor yet. We'll have to approve this bid here. Once we get that approved, we'll sit down with the contractor and we're going to have to do it in phases because we are aware that high school has got the most activities going on throughout the district. So we'll do it in two phases and uh, that's how we'll do it. So we'll have parking for uh, staff and students and whatever's going on. And then we'll do one section and then move over. Then they can park where we did the pavement and then. So, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, quick quick question. Um, on the pavement, you know, I think one of the things that previously been discussed is the possibility of a need for some full full thickness. Um, that's in addition to this cost, correct? If if that does come to pass, where we need to do full there thickness. There is actually some areas that we are doing full depth repairs. The all by default. Yes. Okay. But just some clarity, there could be some other areas that we run into that need full depth repairs that they didn't include on here. The engineers came out and cored it and we're pretty confident of what they they put on their on the, the prints. But if we do run into some additional areas, we'll have to bring that back to the board. Uh, for okay, but we have a good idea. Sounds perfect. Yes. Sounds yeah. great. Okay, good question. Any other questions? All right, Madam President, and I move to approve 8.03 as presented. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, Rachel, would you please collect the vote? Mr. Hull? Yes. Mrs. Baker? Yes. Mrs. Horn? Yes. Mr. Chitwood? Yes. Mrs. Milius? Yes. Mr. Ewing? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Approved. Okay. Uh, moving on to discussion items, and we have several. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Congratulations again. Okay. Um, the first one is um, kind of two, two items together, National Thespian Conference trip and Forensics and Debate National Competition for Spring Hill High School. Dr. Luttrell. Okay, again, and we, as always, anytime we have a, a group that wants to go uh, out of state overnight, they come and just try to give us a brief overview of what they'll be doing, competing, and how they're, why, how the trip came about. So we'll get those individuals here tonight. Uh, first one up is our thespian person. Also, you probably recognize her. She's also the one that directs our outstanding uh, theatrical productions that we have every fall and spring. So... You're up. Hello. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Miss Adriana Wendell, and I am the thespian um, sponsor as long as the theater teacher. So let me just log in. Can I just say bravo on Music Man? Thank you. I appreciate it a lot. That was a big cast. It was a very big cast, that's for sure. And I'll plug you right now, too. Next week is the showing of Macbeth for our, um, our theater group. So anyone who's in town, please check out the website and see times. <laughs> Two <-step laughs> Luckily, I got my watch on, so I can... Um, I can approve it right here from my wrist. So <laughs> we're safe. Do, 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 All right, there we go. Perfect. Okay. 
So I am here to propose that we are to attend the International Thespian Festival, and this will be June 23rd through the 29th. The purpose of travel, it is a week-long festival the last week of June, as I mentioned before, June 23rd through the 29th, where students are able to celebrate theater, engage in various workshops, compete in individual events, and see nationally ranked high school productions. They will be able to learn from professionals all over the country in the theater industry, including professionals in New York and Chicago, so your Broadway artist and all of that fun stuff. Uh, some students that I have with me here today are the students who competed at, in individual events at the state level, also known as thespies, and they qualified to compete at the national level. So the location and itinerary, it will be in Indiana. It'll be on Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Students will be staying on campus in the dorms and being fed breakfast, lunch, and dinner through the dining hall on campus. The dates again, Sunday, June 23rd through the 29th. And then I do have a quick schedule at a glance. We don't need to go over every little thing, but it just kind of shows you a little bit of what to expect and that kind of thing. So we see lots of workshops. We see some main stage performances, 24 hour plays, dinner, uh, select one acts, a bunch of different things. So there's quite a bit of information that students can learn as well as compete there as well. We are looking to leave around 10.30 a.m. on Sunday and make a few stops for meals, and then we'll leave around 9 a.m. that Saturday, the 29th, and again, make stops for meals. Anticipated costs, so the conference itself costs $999, and that includes the housing, the festival, everything. Um, and then for the teacher, it costs $749, and that again includes housing and food. The thespy submissions are $50 per event. And then we had we have one group and then one individual. So it will be $50 per event. So $100 in total in our thespy submissions. So each student will pay about around $1,032 with fundraising opportunities. Um, and then they'll need to need to bring about $65 to cover the cost of meals um, on our traveling days. And then um, I do request that USD 230 cover the teacher reg uh, registration cost and cost of travel, so the suburban and gas. The participants, so I will be the one taking the students, and then I also brought my student attendees with me. So we have Ethan Knust, uh, Savannah Bard, and Zachary Vassar, and I believe that they wanted to chat about why they would love the opportunity to be able to go to this festival. Hi, this is my first time. Um, so I want to attend Thespian Festival. I've been to two state level Thespian Festivals. Uh, and this year I had an absolute fantastic time bringing a competition piece where me and Zach received a superior rating on our Thespi. Um, I know a lot of you guys have seen me and Zach perform, especially in the music man, not to toot my own horn. Um, <laughs> I know. Um, but going to this thespian festival, getting this training from these workshop professionals who are at the Broadway level would be excellent for not just mine, but all of our, uh, future experiences with theater. So I, uh, please. <laughs> I, hi, I'm Zachary Vassar. I am Ethan Canoose's partner in crime and we, uh, I'll just touch a bit more on what we performed. We performed Agony from Into the Woods. So we sang that together and got our ranking. So I'm really excited to go into the International Festival and perform that once again and really get even more experience. I know for me uh, personally, I'm able to carry that into my next following year as a senior, and I can pass on all the experience I gained at International Thespian Conference to the next generation of international um, attendees. So yeah, I'm really excited for the experience, seeing all the shows, attending all the workshops and getting that feedback from our performance uh, if we perform at nationals. So thank you. Hi, I'm Savannah. Um, I know you guys see them on stage all the time, but you don't really see me. And that's what I'd like to talk about to you guys. I stage manage, so I basically run everything. So I'm in control of the lights and the sound. Whenever you see a light go on or off or hear a sound effect, I'm telling them when to go and when to do that. I also coordinate a lot of the emails and I talk to everyone. And I'm always that center of communication. And that's what I presented at um, Thescon 
when we went for the state festival and I scored really well and I got this opportunity to go to internationals. I know my dream is to be on Broadway. I want to stage manage professionally. That's my hope and that's my career. And so it'd be such a great opportunity to meet these professionals and learn from them and hear what they have to say and make those connections because that's really what the theater world is all about. Um, so I just want to say thank you guys for everything. Um, and yeah, that's about it. <laughs> and we are open for questions. Does anybody have any questions for um, Mrs. Ms. Wendell? I'll go first. It's not really a question, but it's three expectations. One, be careful. <laughs> Two, have fun. And three, bring back some bling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a couple questions. Um, yes. more about when you guys said you qualified. Mm -hmm. What tell me tell me more about that? Yes. So in January, they went to the state festival and they competed in these individual events. So for Ethan and Zach here, they performed Agony live in front of judges, and then they received a superior rate rating. So if you think of it like in music terms where there's like a one rating, which is like the best, and then there's a two, which is still pretty good. Superior is essentially like receiving a one. And then so all the so these three students received a superior and that qualifies them to go to compete at the national level where they will be adjudicated the same way, but it's a tougher pool essentially. Is um is was that state competition um local? Yes, that was in Wichita. Ooh, okay. Um and are you I know Ethan was, but are did you guys perform the agony at the maps? Was that um of into the woods that, that? yeah uh, um, yeah i'll come up to the yeah come on up. uh so for mappa funny enough zach wasn't in the show i did it with my <laughs> other friend and i was doing it though so okay okay um well wonderful well i it was great i'm sure that you guys do wonderfully i think <clears throat> why i'm asking is um something that i and this is probably more of a question for the administration um when our sports teams qualify for state, um, we historically have provided transportation and lodging for those teams. So I, I think I've asked this previously, but I would love to understand what our options are providing people that have qualified at state and now national level, providing them with the same, um, the same options. So with state, it's a little different. So it's something that the students can kind of just sign up for. They have to audition through me, but it's not like you qualify for state and then you qualify for nationals. Um, so that is why it's kind of a bigger deal to go to the nationals because you actually qualified for something where at the state level, it's like, do you want to do a competitive piece? And then you just get to do it with my approval, if that makes sense. Absolutely okay. does. So at the state level, that was kind of an option, but now they really qualified and they want to go to nationals. So yes. it's almost like nationals is at the same level as what a state contest would be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll put my voice behind asking that question as well, just so there's a second voice behind it. Hi, I'm Mr. Chitwood. Uh, I'm Madeline Chitwood's dad. <laughs> hey, I got some fans. Just take note, there's some fans. <laughs> so... Yeah, you may be my only ones. Uh, <laughs> and so I just want to make sure we're, we're all aware here because this is what we would do on a Chitwood family road trip. Uh, this is an eight hour and eight minute drive. We're all consenting to being in a car together for eight hours. Okay. Yeah. All right. No, I'm just kidding. This is great. I love it. I'm all about it. That's all I have to say. How many musicals will you have lined up to sing? In eight hours and <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> we're gonna need good headphones, sister. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they may be wearing the headphones and I may be yeah. in charge of the music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, great. I mean, I'm always very supportive of any kind of um trip or experience that you can take, especially I think it's great that this is a career path that at least one or two of you are looking at. So um, I think that um, when you bring it back, we'll bring it back next meeting for action. Yeah, I think we'll be pretty favorable with you. So Alrighty. appreciate you guys coming out and 
and speaking. I enjoy hearing your passion for what you're doing too. Yes. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Can't wait for Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs>
And then the number of students who advance to nationals, it depends on the tournament. So in the national, in the NCFL, we can take the top six in each event. In the NSDA, it varies based on entries, but it's a little more selective, usually top two or top three. But students can only go in one event. So if they compete in multiples and they qualify in both, they have to choose one. But then that also gives other students the opportunity to attend as well. So if you finish seventh or eighth, if you get the right event and the right people ahead of you, you might still be able to sneak in. So um, it just kind of depends. So who is qualified? So for the NCFL tournament, which is over Memorial Day weekend, we are taking five students to that tournament, which, like I said, I believe that is the most that we've ever been able to take to a single national tournament ever. Um, one of them, we have two seniors, Audio Garcia, uh, who's qualified in congressional debate. This would be his third national appearance, um, actually in both tournaments. Um, last year for NCFL, he went all the way to semifinals. And I think he was the first one who missed out on going to finals. So he was like the first cut. Um, but so it'll be his third time. Uh, Max Pacheco is also a senior in public forum debate. We have two sophomores, Kaylee Howell in public forum debate and Tristan Wood in solo acting. And Jackson Roberts is a freshman uh, who's qualified in congressional debate. So we're really excited uh, about the possibilities for these students. And then NSDA, we have at least one student going, Adio Garcia, and we may have additional entries at qualifiers. Uh, they will continue throughout the month of April. Um, so it's possible that we have more students attend as well. I would be going, both myself and my assistant, uh, Emily McBee, would be traveling to both of these two tournaments to supervise. So we'll have two school personnel on site for both tournaments. I know we also have a few parents who are going to pay their own way and, and join us in Chicago for sure. Um, so we'll have some additional parent support there as well. So what our proposals are uh, for the NCFL tournament in Chicago, we're proposing leaving on Friday, May the 24th and returning on Monday, May the 27th. And the students, when we started planning and talking about this, the students really expressed an interest in taking the train from Kansas city to Chicago. It's a pretty, pretty straight shot. So, um, We've agreed to pursue that, but students would cover the cost of the ticket for that. That would not be something that we would be asking of the district. Um, the schedule for the tournament itself, uh, the preliminary rounds are on Saturday, the 25th, and there's usually four prelim rounds during the day. Then in the evening, they will announce who has made the cut to go to the elimination rounds, and those elim rounds go through the day on Sunday with awards being Sunday night. So usually awards are at seven or seven 30 at night. So it doesn't make sense to try and push the envelope to get home Sunday night, get an extra good night's sleep after a long day of competition. Um, for the NSDA national tournament that's in Des Moines, we would leave on Sunday, June 9th and return in the evening on Friday, June the 14th. And we would just ask to use a district vehicle for that tournament since Des Moines is only a three hour drive. It's just a hop, skip and a jump away. Uh, much different than last year when we, when it was in Phoenix, oh. a little bit different uh, situation there. Um, for the NSDA tournament, the, the typical schedule is Monday and Tuesday are the preliminary rounds. And then Tuesday afternoon, all the way through final or Friday morning or when the elimination rounds happen. But even if a student doesn't make it to an elimination round, they have what are called supplemental events that students who don't make it to those elimination rounds can jump into a supplemental event. And they're kind of like fun competitions um, where students can perform as well. So what we're asking of you is just to um, just your blessing and your permission to travel to and from these events in Chicago and Des Moines. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have for me. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Kunkel? Hi, Mr. Kunkel. Um, <clears throat> similar question. Sure. Um, just about qualifying. 
Can you tell me what happened last year in Phoenix? Did our district cover your your ho- your lodging? They covered the lodging for myself as the sponsor, but not for the students. Gotcha. Um, the students pay for um, the lodging as well as if we do anything outside of a district vehicle, um, like last year we did, we flew to and from Phoenix and the students, uh, the students and families paid for that flight. Um, we have done some fundraising in the past that helps families offset that cost. Um, this year it's a little bit lower because the travel is a little closer. Um, but we still do. Yes, it is the family responsibility. Gotcha. And oh, go ahead. That's okay. I just wondered if these, I, I, I was a little confused between the two. Sure. Um, can you explain the qualifying piece of it? Sure. So it's, it's similar. It's just the only real difference is the number of people who advance out of that qualifier. So each of the two tournaments, um, we'll go back here. Which one was it? Um, yeah. So each of the two tournaments, the district holds a qualifier tournament. And that is anybody who's part of that district who wants to compete and wants to try and qualify can attend that tournament. Um, and then usually it'll be three rounds and a finals round. Um, and that finals round will help determine the rank and the order of who the priority of who goes. Um, so usually from the NCFL, we take the top six. So they'll do what's called a semifinals round, which is the top 12 and they'll do a fine, a semis finals round. And then the students with the best scores, it's kind of like the thespians conference and also like golf, the lower the score, the better, um, gives you the higher ranking and the better priority to go. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, so those national qualifier tournaments are around here. Blue Correct. Val- One was in Blue Valley. Correct. So the NCFLs, um, we had, they're actually broken down into three parts. There's one for congressional, there's one for LD and PF debate, and then there's one. They're over three days because sometimes, but one was at uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, one was at Shawnee Mission Northwest, and one was at uh, Sumner. But it's all very within the Kansas City metro. Yes, that's right. Um, and then when you qualify for those, then you can go to the the two tournaments that you're asking about today. Correct. Yes. And if you qualify for NCFL, you get to go to the NCFL. It doesn't automatically do for NSDA because that's its own qualifier in itself. Oh, right. so you can qualify for one, but not the other, if that makes sense. Okay. Whew. Well, <laughs> that is um, a, a little confusing, but got it. Um, no, I think I would just have the same um, question to the administration and clarity on when our district pays for lodging and transportation compared to when they don't for qualifying um, events. And I think like Miss Wendell said, too, I think some of it, at least from my experience, is that there is a higher level of commitment and it is a little higher level of transportation that goes into it. Wichita is a little bit easier drive and a little um, simpler than Chicago, for example. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to speak for the board or anything. I'm just going off of prior experience. Who Um, does own that action item? Because I think it's important. I mean, anytime we're sending Broncos out to represent us at this level, I mean, we're not talking like yeah, I think this is, a, uh, this is a big deal. I just wanted to make a comment, kind of a question, kind of a comment, but maybe kind of a clarification too for the clerks here. <laughs> um, the reason that these things come to us is because we have a board policy about students traveling across state lines. Is that correct? So most things, trips that are done within the state and that's all handled at the building level and doesn't even come to the board. So the board has to give permission for um, students to travel across state line. So that's kind of where that that originated. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, we can probably at some point have a discussion about these other things, but- um, Can I add one yep. thing? I had a chance to sneak back and talk to Mr. Fregon after the last one. Um, I don't wanna speak out of turn. He's gonna go back and check to see what precedence has been in the past. 
um, and get us a little bit more uh, just of the historical reason as to why we've paid for some things and not for others so that you have that before you take action. Yeah, yeah, definitely good questions and stuff. It just, I just kind of want to give some background on why these trips come to us. So I do want to, I'm interested to hear more of that. I don't think that's known because I'm pretty sure some of our sports teams played in Missouri this year. And I don't didn't see there, them come. There may be something about Missouri since it's metro area. Gotcha. I don't know for sure. Okay. We need to probably check on that. But, but just a follow-on question to that is, I mean, just recognizing this is acacia activity and it there are state level stuff. So question mark, are we paying for the state level transportation oh. and, and associated things? Gotcha. Or is that an out of pocket thing? Question mark. Again, I it is acacia uh, activity. Um, we will go back and check and get you more information, but I don't have that information for you okay. right now. Sounds great. Shout out to Mr. Freon, man. You're you're everywhere. You're you're an amazing <laughs> human. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Mr. Cole? Not really a question, but uh, I've got two little ones in elementary school. I try and get myself in as much as I can engaged <laughs> in the high school. Mm -hmm. I follow along on social media with your group mm -hmm. and uh, you're to be commended. Well, I know you, you give your kids a lot of the credit and uh, rightly so, but it's really a, it's really a reflection of the leadership and your dedication to it. So I want to commend you for, for your effort. Well, thank you. Yeah. They're, they're definitely the ones who put in the effort and, and I can, they have to be the ones who memorize some of this. They have to be, they put in a lot of the work. I, I, I got to give them all the credit. They're, they're rock stars and they have really built a foundation for this program that's just going to continue to grow. So I'm, I'm really proud of what all of these students, these students who have qualified and even the students who, who haven't qualified for nationals, but are at state, but, and are even still trying, we've got, we've got a lot of dedicated students who have come in and um, really just, just shot through the moon so far this year. Mm -hmm. Do you, yeah. and what last unrelated question to the Absolutely. trip, I promise. Sure. Go for it. Do you ever need judges? Are you ever in need of volunteer judges? Always. Okay. Um, yeah, especially in the in the month of April as we do some additional qualifier tournaments. And, Good to know. Uh, at state this year is at Lansing High School, so it's pretty local, okay. um, which is kind of nice because last year state was in Valley Center and two years ago was Salina South. So it'll be nice to have something that's kind of close in our backyard. But yes, we're always... We're always looking for for judges and supporters. I'll shoot you an email because I did that for a long time. I love. Oh, it. really? Awesome. Yeah, we would love to have you. Yeah. Very good. So thank you, and thank you both of you for you know solidifying these programs and growing them. We're a growing district. Or these programs should be growing. So it's good to see. Thank you for the opportunity, board. Okay, moving on to review of Library Media Center materials selection review procedures. We have Dr. Smith, and it looks like a whole crew of our library media specialist folks. So, give yeah, uh, again, as speaks for itself, last fall we did uh, develop some guidelines for instructional uh, purchases, selection of textbooks for the classrooms, uh, which should have been in place and had not been. And at the same time, then it was also determined that it would also be wise to have some same process procedures developed for our library media specialists, because although it's somewhat the same process, which they will explain, the library media center uh, specialists have a little bit different criteria from the state statute level. And then, you know, the particular uh, classroom. So I'm going to turn to Dr. Smith and she'll, tell you what they've come up with. And again, we're not asking for action tonight. It's just simply for them to uh, present it, discuss it, and then we'll bring it back next month for an action item, our next meeting for an action item. Okay. Thank you. I have the team of library media specialists here this evening to share a little bit about what our school libraries do and also to share some of the procedures regarding collection development and maintenance uh, that are in alignment with policy IFA. So I'm actually just going to turn it over to the library team and, and let them take it away. Could you guys introduce yourselves too, just so oh. I, I know most oh, of we you. we will. All of you. Just hold on. Okay. 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 I think librarians are usually introverts. That's why I have the mic right now. So <laughs> I'm going to get this thing started. Um, this is your district library team. 
Um, before we talk about the procedures we use when selecting books, we wanted to introduce ourselves and let you know about some of the things we do as library media specialists. I am Shelly Huber. I'm at the OG Spring Hill Elementary School. Um, and our other elementary librarians are Brianna Dalton, Dayton Creek, Dayton Creek, Mandy Schultz, Prairie Creek. Oh, yes, um, we do have a slide. I can ban up for you. Hold on. Um, Marilee Thompson is Timber Sage, and Amanda Preston is at Wolf Creek. Um, so those, so we are all the elementary ones. We wear a lot of different hats to make our libraries exciting places, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the elementary librarians do, and then I'm going to pass it on to Rebecca Fawcett to talk about what the secondary librarians do, at, like the high school and middle school level. Um, click. We wanted to start by showcasing some of the things you would expect to see in a library. These are different pictures from our different libraries. Um, you would see kids reading, checking out, and enjoying books. Our love of reading is what drew all of us into this role of library media specialists and connecting students with just the right book is one of the most rewarding things we can do to help students. So developing and maintaining a collection that engages our students is a crucial part of our job and something we all studied in our library science classes and we do take it very seriously. Um, besides working with books, click, you will find us planning and co-teaching lessons. For example, at the elementary level, we work with teachers to support our new CKLA reading series. We plan and implement STEM and makerspace activities for our libraries. We teach state library standards and introduce the students to research skills. Books are only a small part of what we do in our district libraries. Ms. Rebecca Fawcett is next. Nope, okay. Um... So as a resident of the district and the mom of a couple of Spring Hill grads, I just wanted to take a second before I start to um, say thank you for your service um, in our school board and thanks for your time tonight. Um, I'm the librarian at the high school. I'm Rebecca Fawcett. Our middle school librarians are Lindsay Cox, um, Rebecca Cheek, and Amy Berman. In addition to the responsibilities that Shelley mentioned, at the secondary level, we also do a lot with tech. Um, the posts that you see on our school's social media accounts and the news articles on the school's websites, that's us. Um, we're the communications liaisons for our buildings. And at the secondary level, we are also the technology liaisons for our students and teachers. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <clears throat> that means that any tech problems come to us first, and if we can't figure out what's wrong, we send it on to the district IT department for help. Um, so our days are often busy assisting students and teachers and just making sure that their days run smoothly. Now that you know a little bit about the things that our students see us doing in a typical day, um, let's talk a little bit about the behind the scenes part of our library management job and the procedure manual that's in front of you. With the split of the IF policy into separate curriculum and library policies, we were asked to describe the process that we go through when we develop and maintain um, up-to-date and relevant collections for our students. So you'll find that information um, on pages two through four in the document, specifically pages three and four really um, focus in on um, what we do. The reconsideration policy is next, and that comes straight from your board policy. And then in the appendices, you'll find three documents from the American Library Association that address access to library materials. And then finally, Appendix D um, is the reconsideration form that, a reconsideration form that's specifically geared toward um, library books. Combined, our libraries have over 80,000 items. Collection development is not a task that we take lightly. We spend many, many hours reading book reviews and selecting books for our libraries that suit the age and the interests of our students. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to introduce ourselves and to talk a little about our role in the school district while you're considering the policy and what we do behind the scenes. Thank you guys. Does anybody have any questions? We don't have the document that you're referring to that I can see on the board doc, so. Um, That's what the blank books are. Yeah, yeah. We are wanting to follow. <laughs> <laughs> it's been very much time. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we have the presentation, but we don't have the document, don't so. Have the document. Yeah, okay, so um, when we do, 
go through that. We may have some questions that will probably, if you have questions, I would say direct to Dr. Smith and then she can get to the, does anybody else have any other questions? Um, I just want to say thank you um, to you guys. Cause I know that you're kind of the unsung heroes that, you know, people don't, you aren't their front and center, but you do a lot of really good work. Thank you for tooting our horn. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody have any other questions? So this, the plan is to bring this back for action at our next meeting. Oh, you have a question? Okay, you have a question. Well, uh, the the maker uh, stuff, I love the maker stuff. Nick at Johnson County Library, which I'm sure you all know who Nick is. Uh, I love it. So are we, just a quick question, are we doing maker at the secondary level in libraries or just at the elementary? Is, is it moving from the library to the classroom, question mark? Um, we did have a maker space at the high school library for, I want to say, four or five years. That space was needed this year for a computer lab, and so I gave that up for um, computer lab space. So we did have. Okay. And well, then I'm glad I asked that question. Yeah. Yeah. Good questions? Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, guys. It wasn't so bad, was it? It was not bad. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Thank you guys. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, moving on to our next discussion item, the review of athletic trainer contract and agreement. And I guess this is Mr. Fregon, who is everywhere. So I hear <laughs> literally. Yes, we have uh, for many many years have had a uh, an agreement with uh, a uh, medical uh, institution to provide athletic uh, trainer services specifically for uh, the uh, high school. Uh, it's been a very uh, good partnership. Most high schools, most all high schools, have such an, an arrangement in place. Uh, our current agreement three-year agreement that we've been on expires at the end of this school year on June 30th of uh, 24. This uh, new contract would be a three-year agreement. It outlines, you know, again, what the services are. Really, it's the same services, except we did uh, put it in there because there has been some instances where there's been um, some interest in maybe having an athletic trainer at some middle school events. And uh, Clay will tell you that they don't, technically tend to not do an athletic trainer simply for middle school because of the fact that they have a, uh, they don't have an abundance of individuals that uh, uh, are just standing by willing to do that. And so they have to try to make prioritize uh, the, the high school settings, but did note that we can request them for activities as long as we give uh, some advance notice and, you know, the outer rate. So I'll turn it over to Clay and he can give you some more specifics. And again, we're just giving discussion tonight and would bring it back for action at our next meetings. For sure. And, uh, and he, as he mentioned, a lot of high schools, yeah, back up. I have a lot of boys. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a lot of high schools do have, have tr athletic trainers. However, uh, we have, I feel like one of the best trainers in the state and Jamie Blackham, she's, she's awesome. Uh, she puts in a lot of time. Uh, it, it outlines as far as some of her restrictions, but I know she goes well and beyond that uh, from week to week. Uh, but we do try to uh, abide by those, uh, the contract as far as it outlines uh, her hours per week. Uh, so we work together on that. Uh, as you also may, and I'm sure you know, uh, it was through Olathe Med and then they got uh, bought out by KU Med. So it was a merger, uh, a merger. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, so a merger between the two. And so, uh, that's also, uh, that, that word is in there. Uh, we'll have a few banners up too. That'll be updated. Uh, that they, they post. It's also part of this contract. Uh, as you, uh, Dr. Latrell also mentioned, uh, there was a need in, in our middle schools, I uh, talked about uh, wanting to see if there's some times that they could be able to have an athletic trainer at certain events. Uh, predominantly, we were thinking about with football games. Uh, and so uh, we've kind of outlined as far as when those would occur. Uh, obviously, those are only for home games. So all of this is for home games, all of its home games, except for 
varsity uh, high school football games is when the only time that she travels. Um, so with middle school, uh, as he also mentioned, I just want to clarify that too. Uh, that'll just be if uh, they are able to find somebody to fill that spot. They were fairly confident, but they just can't guarantee that they're always going to have somebody there. And it would be somebody different. Um, that's just how they do that. They are, are able to, to uh, whoever they're able to get at that particular time uh, and uh, be able to meet that need. So uh, any other questions you guys have? Was this a big um, price increase from the last contract? And Dr. Luttrell will probably have that. I don't believe so. I didn't. A very, um, if any, much of an increase. Yeah. So that's... Maybe 3% because because when I will, and I did want to draw attention to not that, but if you look on that very first page of the contract bullet point three or number item three, and you look at that cost that we're paying, yeah, that is, yeah, that's I mean, when that week, that, and, and we're getting 40 hours a week yeah. there. Wow. Or, I mean, so I mean, that, that price schedule, yes. Oh. And it is one very good uh, contract deal. But again, but again, you got to remember they're in it for the purpose of they want a presence in the schools. You know, they they understand. You know that uh, oh, the importance of uh, of youth uh, safety and when it comes to injuries and uh, but so man, it, it's a very good price uh, that they uh, that they have given us in the past and continue that forward. So the seventy six hundred dollars is paid twice a year, or that's. It's paid, half of that it's is paid, paid half of that right. is paid by C here. Yeah, so wow. I just wanted to make sure that's right. right? Wow. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Wow. So yeah, well, and, yeah. and <laughs> does it is it is it serving its purpose? For sure. It, yeah. Yes. Yes. It's yeah. good. It's good by you. Very good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Especially the one would, we have here in yeah. Spring Hill. If you want to see her really in action go to a wrestling tournament yeah. we <laughs> we just watched her for like 30 minutes yeah. it was truly remarkable okay. um and she does do a little bit more than just athletics i know my theater daughter got um sawdust in her eye actually i think we were all together at the baseball game that day right. and i went over and talked to her and she helped me know a few things to do that night and she helped to flush the eye out and yeah. so she's really she's really amazing for sure yes okay i I um, will also say that I'm excited that we're leading the way in middle school trainers or the possibility there. Um, I was at two middle school events um, this last year or maybe even the year before um, where emergencies happened and it is on our principal or the athletic director to care for those children in football one i think was a displaced shoulder one was a broken severely broken leg um it that is um a lot of pressure on those yes. people um so it would be awesome i think that at the time when i asked about it it was nobody else has it so if we could start that trend for the safety of our students and for the peace of mind for those administrators i think that's great Sure. Is there, this is just a question maybe for administration more, um, and not that you're not administration, but no. it, but it, are we required by statute to have so many, to have somebody present at all these games or? Are we required to have an athlete? Yeah. Or, yeah. You're not required. No. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's all I need to know. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Frigo? No. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Okay, um, moving on, student resource officer contract. It looks like we have Captain Martinez and a couple other folks from the. Yes, we have uh, Tim Meek. Uh, we'll be we coming up, and then if we have questions and we need to have our uh, in our entity that you know is kind of been our partner with SRO, we, we can have them uh, uh, you know speak. But and Mr. Meek and I have been working uh, quite some time trying to figure out the best. Uh, concept ago, there's been no secret. School shootings continue. The SROs, two that we have in place, do fantastic. We do have more schools open now in uh, in recent years, and uh, you can never put too much of a premium on safety. You, you've had parents speak to the board after virtually any tragedy, and 
say they know we're doing all we can, but they'd like for us to see if we can always stretch and do more. And so with this three-year contract currently set to expire and we're negotiating a new one, uh, Mr. Meek and I have uh, worked with Johnson County Sheriff's Department to continue our partnership and possibly also try to address the need to possibly increase, but keep it within our budget. So Mr. Meek, I'll let you talk a little bit and then we can open it up for discussion. Again, we'll bring it back for final action next meeting. Absolutely. It's been a good process to work through these guys. Uh, first, a little bit of sticker shock when we first saw the, the increase, but uh, when you start to know the reason behind it, a uh, pretty large uh, increase in pay rate for the officers to begin with, plus their vehicles, all those things have had large um, increases as well. Uh, but the good thing is they were willing to sit down with us and start looking, how can we whittle this back a little bit? So we were able to take and whittle it back and they got a little creative on the staggered, uh, a little bit lower rate to start with to a middle rate to a higher rate at the end. And, and uh, in that scenario, uh, and basically we, we went to uh, checking that scenario and, and no matter how many officers if we are, Add the fourth one, or uh, at some point, even the last year, it still is cheaper to do the staggered rate than than uh, if we would go the the flat rate. Basically, uh, you know, we we worked with them a lot. They were great to work with as far as vehicles. They figured out, hey, we could keep this uh, the SROs in a vehicle one year longer. That'll lower our costs down, and so we were able to uh, take a little bit out of that for that type of thing. So, uh, like I said, it's been been good to work with those guys. Uh, and again, they, if you have any questions for them, they'd be glad to answer it too. So, does anyone have any questions? Uh, it like you. Well, I, yeah, it's. You know, I I recall when I was sitting out there uh, at the end of last year as a patron, um, a discussion, I think some of the sheriff's department had come in and done a presentation at that time. And there was some talk about the costs associated with bringing on a new SRO and who funds the tab for, you know, the lion's share of the gear, the vehicle. And I'm just, you know, I'd, I'd like some clarity around that, you know, so if we bring on a new SRO, what exactly, what exactly are we paying for, um, for that officer at, uh, let's just kind of roll it all up to, and just call it a hundred K for the year, hundred grand for the year. Basically I, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but the costs were, looking at is for our services for 173 days and that includes the cost for all those items that you just said okay we're not we're not paying for them for the summer months or over the winter holiday right it's basically their cost for a year divided by 173 days yeah uh, and so that's how it, that's how it is so again yes we are paying for the the cost of the vehicle for the days that we have them on site so and and other items that they would have so uh yeah the the other thing and I, this is obviously not i'm not stepping into the negotiation but it's been no secret um at least from my position that i truly won't be satisfied until we have an sro in every building every every learning center um and I, this is definitely a step in the right direction to have the addition of another one for next year. And Dr. Luttrell was gracious enough to kind of explain to me what we were up against to add the fourth. But in my opinion, uh, I'd like to see that fourth be added if possible to the next year. And again, I'm not negotiating, but I'm just suggesting that we maybe take the, the appropriate steps to get the County commissioners involved, uh, to get on their radar, um, you know, you've got 500 sworn employees over there at, at the at the at the department. 
And it was my understanding that you're not prepared to add that fourth one. And as a result, it was going to cost us more. Um, not to mention the fact that we were going to have to go to uh, to the county commission. The, the politics of it, I understand, having to get the approval for it. And if we need to get that ball in motion, I would suggest to Dr. Luttrell that we kind of Kind you kind of grease the skids for that piece. Um, because again, I don't think there's a single greater thing that we can do for the safety of our kids uh than to have one of your professionals in each of our learning centers. And to me, that is it's priceless. It's it, you know, God forbid, God forbid that anything should ever go wrong, but it it sure makes me feel better to know. Uh, that there is a present presence in each building, right? Um, and like I said, having the one, it, I, I'm extremely grateful for that. But in my mind, I've kind of settled on the fact that, okay, it may be unreasonable to really suggest that we get one in every learning center, but at least one in the high school and one in each of the middle schools. I think that is that is probably where we should be uh, as a goal. Uh, and so if there's anything that you can answer for me on exactly the, the, the readiness or the preparedness for that, because if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Luttrell, we've got the option for the fourth included in here, right? Yeah, the option for the fourth is available. However, again, it would just take legwork in advance, like you pointed out that. Well, you educated me on that, right? We yeah. would we would want to make, because just to just say, okay, we're going to add fourth for next year for fiscal year 27 tw fiscal year 26 we can't do that without getting in front but right. then the board of county commissioners would have to say yes we bless that yeah we come back yeah but, but yes it would just take you know working with uh the department and making sure they got us and when the proper time to do that would be yes yeah so if we, so i guess that's the question if we if you know if knowing that we want that fourth what kind of lead time are we up against with going through the process? Okay. Um, Captain Frank Martinez, uh, over our patrol division, which our community policing falls under that as well, which is where the SROs are attached to. So what, in, in talking with Dr. Luttrell, one of the things we had talked about is just, we have the staffing, um, where it gets tricky is that 68% of the year, I think that's six, correct. 68% of the year, um, that deputy would be assigned to the school district. So what we have to do, because the money that we get out of this contract does not come back to us. That goes straight back to the uh, county. the county. So we would have to uh, go to the board, put it on their agenda, and ask that they allow us to get that extra body for that back half, that 32%, because that's an increase to our staffing. Uh, but we would utilize that body for relief on patrol, et cetera, special events, uh, so that body would be used in in the off uh, season out of school. But as far as getting you extra bodies, it basically boils down to if you want the bodies, we would go and partner together, go in front of the school board, share the the reasons, the concerns and the why we want the bodies. Because believe me, we want to be in the schools. We we have a great relationship. We've had a great relationship with Spring Hill for years. Um, the SROs do a great job. But as you know, they're busy between two is the size of Spring Hill. It's not small anymore. It's wide. It's got a lot of students and it's growing. So we feel we need to have more of an imprint in the schools. But what that would look like is that if you said you want four, you want three or four, we would then find, we would put it out to our deputies. They would then put in for it. We have a selection process. Uh, we would assign a deputy to the school where the time frame crunch comes in is when we have to backfill that person via patrol, um, uh, if, if it's somebody new who's not what we call patrol certified, they would have to go through a four month training process. So that's where we have to get people up to speed and where the lull could come. So the, the more advanced notice we have, the better off we could be um, just to get that position backfilled or created. And then we try to always get our SROs through NASRO and CASRO before they get into your schools because there's so many resources, uh, connections they can make, um, new trends um, that would help bridge some of those gaps between what's going on nationwide and what would be going on in Spring Hill. That's actually, that's a really good point too. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but you said 68% of their time. So is it safe to assume that we're covering 68% of the cost? 
Yes. Yeah. That, that's where we get the figures from. Okay. And you talked about certification. Is that is that some type of formal certification then for an SRO to be an SRO? Uh, yes. Yeah, so they to get the Kansas uh, um, School Resource Officer blessing as well as a national. And it just allows them to, um, it's just like accreditation for that SRO. Uh, is it needed? No, not necessarily. Um, but it, it really bodes well for them to understand and learn and work with the schools. Just any connections they make with, hey, we see this trend happening in St. Louis. It could be coming your way. Or if we see something here we don't understand, they've got a plethora of resources that they can email, call. Uh, just connections, just networking like when you all go to your school board conferences. Okay. And I would assume you guys are having the same uh, same difficulty as everybody else trying to backfill positions, right? Trying to stay so, current on your roster. So our um, we we made a big push here within the last 18 months. Uh, the sheriff made a priority to get a staff. I think at one time, several years ago, we were close to 70 short. And I think now we're probably in the teens. So staffing wise, we're in a good spot. Uh, it's just a matter of making sure we get the right fit for your school, as well as making sure they're trained and certified. Um, because there's a lot to go to it, not just in the school function, but we use that officer as well in our community policing events. Um, with that as well, we'll also still staff your security events, your school. We always try the, uh, Deputy Petschik and Ramos do an outstanding job in making sure that they have somebody there at your baseball games, wrestling events, basketball, and now continue by having that third SRO or fourth SRO. It allows us to get more face time and to, um, into the school. But I'll just say this real quick. One thing that our SROs do that's different than if you check with some of the other local SROs, they don't get into the elementary schools. These guys find it. It's important to get into the S, uh, elementary schools, but you'd only, don't, ju you don't just get those SROs. You also get Gus, our therapy dog, who will come to the schools. Um, he's, he's there for comfort. He's there for uh, interaction to get younger children to understand who police are. Um, we, to understand that we are there to help them. And that connection we make at that young age is so, so crucial and important. So that's one thing we pride ourselves on. We'll go from everywhere from elementary, middle and high and seeing the interactions as these kids grow older, get to know our SROs is great. Yeah. And I can't, I, I, I can't say any, anything more uh, about uh, how grateful we are uh, for the two that we've got and the caliber of the caliber of, character and individuals that those are. And I would expect that's what we'll see out of our third. So I'm going to use this public forum then again, not to negotiate, but to send a message to the county commissioners that a, while we're grateful for the staggered savings that represents a 1.3% discount. And I think we can all agree that, you know, in the scheme of discounts, that's not that great of a discount. Right. And I would almost challenge the county commissioners then to perhaps get a little more creative and think about a way that we could get that fourth added next year in exchange for some type of extended period. Maybe we do a four year or even a five year deal um, and see if that doesn't kind of help shave the cost off or at least extend a discount uh, so that we're getting into a, into a material discount. If you can't tell, I negotiate contracts for a living. And uh, so I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there using this public forum, but we're extremely grateful for everything that you do. We look forward to a very long lasting relationship, continued relationship with uh, Johnson County Sheriff's Department. And we appreciate your guys' service big time. Thank you. Yep. Does anyone else have any other questions? I'll try to be really short. Okay. Just coming from a historical standpoint, because I want to make sure I'm remembering everything correctly. Moving to this, you know, 94K, uh, a deputy, I think that represents like a 30, 40% increase over the previous contract. Is that right? Am I in the ballpark? Yes, just um, so our salaries went up anywhere from 20 to 30% uh, within the last year and a half. Um, and I think the contract that we had before hadn't even taken in the previous um, pay increase. So this this is a big leap. And it's not just, uh, we also do uh, contracts with the city of De, uh, DeSoto and Edgerton for policing services. So that was another big, uh, another agencies or uh, cities that we also went to a price hike with. Uh, but again, none of that money comes back to the sheriff's office. We're not making money on these. It's just to recoup our costs at the direction. Sure. sure. And, you know, in that, again, correct me where my understanding is wrong is, you know, um, my understanding is that the, the county board of commissioners, you know, decided to include 
some of the other carrying costs, you know, vehicles, um, gear and that kind of stuff in that number as well. And it, it wasn't, it not representative of wages entirely is, am I understanding correctly or am I? Right. We try to recoup the cost of those created positions. I will say that we were creative, uh, to look at how could we keep a vehicle, uh, just cause the cost of vehicles, like everything else is super expensive to upfit a car for an officer right now is right around 70, some thousand, 74, $75,000, uh, by the time you upfit it and you buy the vehicle. So that was something we discussed with uh, Dr. Luttrell that, cause that is, that is a big cost, but we were able to, I believe in this contract to look at keeping another vehicle set aside. So extending the life of that vehicle, it's safe. It would do everything we need to, to help be good partners with the school district to lower those costs because, we we know sticker shock can cause people to be to to shy away and go other places, but we didn't want that with this school district uh, or any of our other partners that we work with where we do contracts. Yeah, and, and just going that direction, recognizing the dis decisions that the county commissioners have made, and, and some of your comments, Mr. Hall. You know, I think this may behoove us to have a conversation as a board to come out with an official policy statement saying what our ask is, because, you know, quite frankly, it's, I think we all agree it's in the county's best interest uh, as well as our own and, and coming at this from a cooperative standpoint, what that looks like, I don't know, but I, I'm kind of speaking to them now. I, I appreciate you. And I just wanted to make sure I wasn't off base there. Thank you. Any other questions? I think um, my question isn't necessarily for you, but for Doug, where where would this these funds come out of? Is there space? I mean, do you see this being any issue or would we have to like cut coupons somewhere? <laughs> How much can we make by cutting coupons? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, we have a couple different uh, funds that we could pull it from general fund, uh, LOB, uh, capital outlay. I think you could make an argument there. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's kind of a give and take. So if, if we're going with the fourth one, the cost another hundred thousand plus, that's the equivalent of two teachers. Um, well, maybe not quite two teachers, but it's getting close. So we can do it, but um, it could cut in ca cash balances. And we've already talked about how tight they are already. So um do we raise a mill levy to help fund it? I mean, that that's another option. We we could raise the mill levy if this was a high priority to everybody in this community and we could pay for it that way. So it'd just be a matter of talking it out, looking at the different options and seeing what what would be the best one for everybody. So so there's there's space currently for a third, but we, we would make a third work okay, yes without stretching the rubber band too tight, but a fourth one, it would be a pretty big commitment for us. Okay. A fourth one next year or a fourth one, um, as the schedule it. Yeah. Second or third year. I'm like looking to. Yeah. If I'm not it, the way I read that, uh, Nicole, it's the third year of that three-year contract, not necessarily the second. Yeah. yeah. And if it's a little ways down the road, we can work ourselves to that position to where we can kind of plan and budget for it and, okay. and add it without it being too painful. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for our friends? Good. I had, I had one asked talking with Dr. Luttrell. I would just like to see a little bit about what the SROs day look like a little bit. Yes. Uh, I had that conversation with uh, a couple members recently, and I do think that would be something that, uh, I'll try to, I can try to get on the uh, calendar for one of our future meetings in the next, you know, three or four months is to have our SROs come and maybe do a brief 10 or 15 minute presentation just on what a somewhat typical day looks like in the life of an SRO. I think that would be very beneficial because it's be a little glimpse, but like I said, it's not going to be exact because like I said, their day changes no two days are like BS. That hopefully we get that set up in the next couple months. I think along with that, what might be helpful is also like just a general idea of what what other um, patrolling is going on with the county and with the city. 
Um, and City of Olathe, City of Spring Hill, are they patrolling around the schools as well? What other kind of law enforcement presence is there um, around the buildings? So that would be helpful as well. Okay. Yes. Is everybody, any other questions? Okay, we still have, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and if you didn't know, Captain Martinez is a graduate of Spring Hill High School, so. Yes, I've been school for about 12 years. Uh, that's oh, awesome. So he's one of us. <laughs> um, we still have one, two, three, four discussion items. So I think we'll go ahead and take a quick break. Um, and we will um, come back at um, 839. It's 10 minutes. Are you sure? Yeah, thank you.
We are back in session. Um, discussion item 9.05, elementary student devices. Yes, we have uh, the next couple items are from our technology department and our uh, director of technology, uh, Mr. Phil Elliott, will give us uh, insight on those two items. So I really put everything here in the in the write up. Um, generally speaking, we we need to add a few Chromebooks uh, since they are on the last year of their rotation. It didn't seem like a good move to to buy a hundred or so of those that we knew were more than likely not going to continue. Um, and so the recommendation based on the the secondary project. Um, originally give you a little history when we made the decision to go Chromebook second through fifth, it was really about a touchscreen device with a keyboard. That was, those were the two things that were really the critical components. And at the time the iPad didn't have an attached keyboard. The only option was a Bluetooth battery powered keyboard. And you can imagine 25 or 30 of those in an elementary school classroom and trying to keep them paired with, with the iPad and charged separately and all that kind of stuff. With the new cases uh, that, that we're using, that attached keyboard kind of makes the difference. The other big piece that's not necessarily even alluded to here is the Apple Classroom controls that uh, we can get those kinds of controls, but it's a purchased item on a Chromebook platform. Uh, where the teacher can literally lock them into an app, lock them into a web page. They can they can see what the kids are doing from their device, that kind of stuff. So the classroom management piece is one of the big reasons to look at this at the secondary or at the elementary level as well. So, can you it, tell like if people are actually using those um, controls? Like yes, people? absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the secondary they've been doing in service and stuff like that. So there, uh, there's like we actually have two pieces. One of them is just the Apple Classroom piece, which is what I expect the elementary to use. And then the high school has started doing quite a bit with Jamp Teacher, which is just a it's just got more controls, more tools, more bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Does so anybody have any questions for Phil about the elementary student devices? Yeah, Phil, on those iPads, you know, what else do we get? For that price because i can get that i uh, and i'm assuming is that a gen, is that a ninth generation do you know that's a ninth gen only because the 10th gen keyboard that we would want isn't currently out and i don't feel good about recommending a purchase of something that i haven't been able to test yeah so the 10th gens would more than likely what we would see next year for the three through five yeah um while the the keyboard we have works the one caveat on the 10th gen is they don't have the three and a half millimeter headphone jack. It's USB-C only. And so the keyboard that I'm looking at, uh, that's I've got all the specs for, and they're supposed to hit the US in May uh, on that 10th gen is a, uh, the case itself has a three and a half millimeter headphone jack so that you can still use the cheaper set of headphones uh, with them. And it's just a little less uh, connectivity potential damage as the USB C is for elementary school kids plugging that in and out. Okay. So, so it's the keyboard and the the keyboard and the and the eighth gen or ninth gen iPad. Yeah. I I, I don't know if because I, I just pulled it up and I can get it at Walmart for two sixty nine. So I'm just wondering, do you go back to Apple Education and say, hey, I'm going to get them from Walmart? Yeah. It, unfortunately, <laughs> um, Apple Apple has. And I have, I have yet to figure out how they do it. Yeah. But Apple's price is Apple's price. And and they set it, they sign state and federal contracts. So that I can't even buy them. I, from all of my other vendors who sell Apple products, they're not even authorized to sell them. That's a good, that's another good point too. So this is kind of, good. I don't know what Kansas calls it, but this is through the GSA, the government, the government yeah, contract. N -N -A -S yeah, yeah. I don't forget okay. which one. Right. NASPO or something like that. Yeah. Hi, yes. I have a question. Yeah, <clears throat> hold so, on. I apologize. Look, one of one of the follow up that that includes the keyboard. So the price includes the keyboard that we are in that recommendation. So it was the the iPad and the keyboard case. Ooh. So okay. sorry. Go ahead, Nicole. I apologize. That's okay. No worries. Um, it. I think that my well, first of all, we're only buying three hundred and fifty. Right, second grade. 
sec, only second grade. Yeah, the, uh, I wanna, I'm going to try to get the, the fourth year out of the Chromebooks and the three through five. I just don't have enough with the damage we've been getting and the growth to get that without buying some additional. So a um, cu couple questions. Um, one, have you surveyed teachers and because these don't go home. Correct. But have you surveyed teachers and think that this is going to be the right solution? And I only ask that because of the plethora of complaints we heard from when we moved to the iPads for a secondary. I'm not aware of those complaints. So you took an interview with the kids. So yeah, but that we, we had two interviews with the kids. The first one, they had challenges. We addressed all the issues. And the next one, they literally said, we love them. Wasn't that Dr. Luttrell? And that, through, through, the through our superintendent, student advisor, yep. advisor committee, we met with them back in the September of the first of the year and then again. and answered their questions. And then we came back and I guess it was in October, November, talked to them again. And they were said we've gotten used to them. And but it did. It, there was a learning curve for sure. sure. I, I hadn't heard that. I was referring to the the SPUB interview that. Thank you for taking that. I was when oh, I first that saw is. that, I was yeah. like. Ooh, oh, no, that's no Bill, you are, no, you're a right. brave soul, but so the second grade one, we discussed with the secondary or the elementary administrators okay. and asked them based on the use case, they went and got feedback. So that's where this recommendation came from. Okay. So the, the, the teachers feel like this could be a great solution moving forward. Cause I, I think that I just don't, I'm hesitant be, because of the feedback I received and we did receive quite a few emails and quite a few complaints about it. So, um, but I know that secondary, what they use it for is different than elementary. Sure. Um, along with, hold on, uh, will you tell me about the damage? Because I thought one of the um, perks of getting going towards the iPad was that we had like a free replacement or something like that. Yeah. And that'll actually be on the next topic, the secondary ones. Oh. We're not going to do that on the elementary ones because they don't go home. Um, and, and really most of that, the elementary ones... Uh, the, the kindergarten and first grade ones we have now, we almost get no damage on. And so it, it's $49 per device for a three year. And it just doesn't pay out oh, for okay. the, el the elementary school. Project. Gotcha. Sorry. I'm, I think I was confused just because it said damage. We need to add some inventory, but that's on our old one. On the Chromebooks. Okay. I yes. understand now. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, quick question on, on these devices. So are we also going to need to get associated Charging carts and docks. And no, they'll all utilize the existing. Uh, so we already got everything to yeah. keep us running. Okay, cool. Yeah, we, we'll swap out the cords in them that the Chromebook plugs into and for the iPad cord. So, yep. Go team. Okay. Any other questions about the elementary device? I am look. Sorry, I am looking for some some used uh, of the iPad specific carts. Uh, I've got some different vendors that deal in used stuff, and we have purchased those for about ten percent. Hypertech. Uh, uh, that's not one of them, but yeah, same idea. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions about the elementary devices? Okay, go ahead and move on to the iPads for growth at secondary level. I'm I'm assuming that's you too. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we have about a hundred, according to uh, RSP's uh, numbers, we have about 148 new students expected for next year in the six through twelve. About a hundred of those comes just from seniors leaving and sixth grade coming in, right? I mean, that, that the delta in there is about a hundred of those. Uh, the other forty-eight are spread amongst the the six through twelve just in growth. So uh, this is to get us enough to make sure that we cover that. In addition, without spoiling a future topic tonight, uh, making sure that we we have we have a few spaces depending on what the board comes up with on the open enrollment. So. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about the iPads for secondary? Okay. We're good. So this will come back next meeting? Correct. Okay. Yep. So moving on, 9.07 capacity numbers for open enrollment. Looks like Dr. Robbins. Yes. Uh, again, open enrollment. You've been hearing about it about every meeting. It's set to commence in the next school year in August, but now's the time where we have to start putting word out, capacity numbers, and D Dr. Robinson's going to give you the latest updates on where we're at with that and talk capacity a little bit. 
it seems like this has been my life this year, <laughs> capacity number. So um, one of the things I would offer tonight before I even start is if you have a lot of questions, I know that um, tonight you're being very conscious of the time. I'm happy to meet one-on-one -on -one with anybody too and kind of go through how we've come to the calculations and what we're trying to do with I think it. I think actually we're doing pretty good on time. Okay. So if you have a little bit that you had in your back pocket that you want to pull out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I put a couple things in here, and there is a lot of text on these first couple slides, but part of that is knowing that we may have people um, that aren't here tonight that will access this information. So I wanted to make sure uh, that if that's the case, they could see where we were coming from. So the first couple slides are just kind of a reminder of why we're here. Uh, one of those, obviously, is change in statute. Um, I also want to point out to the board that you will see our recommendation split K-8 and 912. And that's not normally how we operate. Normally, you'll see six, seven, eight more with the high school, um, but it is the way it's in statute. And so that's why it's broken out that way. Uh, what we can use to determine capacity is a little bit different K-8 than it is on the um, high school side. Uh, we also back um, in the fall approved a policy that also outlines the um, components that we could use to cons to determine capacity. Um, I'll share a little bit about the student teacher ratios that we're using and why we're using those, as well as the percentage of growth that we've uh, that we're using for each building as we go. Um, again, some of this I'll talk more as we go through the example I have in here. Uh, we are currently for K eight using a uh, one teacher to every 22 students at elementary. That's fairly simple because you can use your classroom teachers. So at third grade, if I've got three classroom teachers, I know I can put up to 22 kids in each classroom. At middle school and high school, we chose to use their core language arts classes. And part of that was trying to come to a course that all students would need to take. We continued to use one to 22 at the middle school level. Um, because uh, because of the architectural pieces of um, both uh, Woodland and Forest Spring, that was the calculation that was used when those buildings were built. Um, the high school, we used a little bit higher number. Um, and part of that, just to be really frank, it wouldn't have mattered if we were using 1 to 26 or 1 to 22. We're going to have capacity issues at the high school, and that's something uh, that I believe the board's very aware of over the next couple of years that we're going to have to take into account um, the other thing we did when you look at capacity, and I'll explain a little bit of how this worked, um, each section we reduced by two students per section, and part of that was to allow for space for um, those mandatory or priority um, students in policy, so students that are experiencing homelessness under McKinney-Vento, students that are in the care of uh, Division of Children and Family Services, and um, uh, employees uh, of the district, their children. And part of that is you don't know where those students will fall out. And so we wanted to make sure across the board we had uh, room to accommodate them as they enroll. And then um, again, I'll talk growth projection as we go. Any questions so far? So when you said um, two students per classroom or section, so classrooms K through five, section yep. six through 12. Yep. Okay but just different ratios for high school, middle school. Okay. Yep, that's the only difference so far. Um, the policy and statute allowed us to also take into account limiting factors. So other factors that we know about the different buildings. So uh, for example, um, Spring Hill Elementary, we know houses both a behavior program and an autism program. Um, it also, is the one of the only buildings in the district that we utilize our Title I funds, um, which requires us to have a little bit different staff ratio. So we took all of that into account as we did the calculations as well. Um, we tried to look across the board at, um, uh, at the middle school and high school level at some of the shared staffing positions that we have, as well as what increases would do to some of those common spaces. I mean, we've talked about locker rooms and lunch rooms and things like that that are already um, at their capacity. So what happens if we continue to, to allow for additional um, students from out of the district? So what I tried to do tonight, just to give you a better idea, 
you have inboard docs, you have the full document as to how we calculated um, each building. So you can see that, but I wanted to walk you through one school just so you can have a better understanding. So I use Timber Sage. Um, so this is kind of the end result, but current enrollment, uh, we, I asked for Phil and his team to run um, our current enrollment around as close as we could get to March 1st. And part of that was so that we could duplicate it year to year. Um, I wanted something more current than September 20th because one of the trends we've seen in Spring Hill is that where we start in the fall and where we end in May mm -hmm. can be drastically different in some of our schools based on how fast houses are being built. Um, so we took current enrollment, um, students that are actually enrolled at Timber Sage um, on or as close as we could get to March 1st. Oop. There we go. The adjusted growth is kind of a weird one. And there's probably a lot of ways we could have looked at doing this. What I did with it was take the projection from RSP that you saw, I believe, in January, end of January, beginning of February for Timber Sage, which has Timber Sage's total capacity five years out as far as we can project out um, going from 386 now to 557 and increase all of our classes by that percentage. And part of that is to protect space uh, for students who we're projecting will live in our district during that time um, before we allow students from outside of the district. So that percentage, you'll see it on the calculations um, spreadsheet, is different for each of our schools. So depending on where they are and what was projected for growth, that percentage is different for each school. Um, that's how we got that adjusted enrollment for growth. Oh, what year? Clicking. What year did you say this was um, just to growth? I think the latest one from RSP projected out to 28-29. Okay. We could use a different number. I would tell you it um, it probably creates open spaces at two of our schools. Um, interesting, it's Spring Hill Elementary and Spring Hill Middle School based on staffing. Um, that probably causes us some problems um, because of the Title I, the way we're using Title I funds, we probably put some of that uh, at risk because of trying to keep our, our ratios uh, different. So. Like I said, some of this, if you've got questions, I'm happy to sit down and talk in more depth. But um, And just remind me, Dr. Robinson, I think we've covered this before, too, uh, open enrollment. So somebody somebody gets in under open enrollment. Once they're in, they're in. Once they're in, they're in. You can't say, hey, we're full next year and uh, sorry. No. So part of what I'm trying to do with the calculation is protect the district in a lot of ways. One of those would be Timber Sage is a good example in that right now, um, it's got me editing, Phil, for some reason. See if I can go, there we go. Timber Sage has three sections currently. The board could choose at some point down the road to add a fourth section, right? We have the room, the classroom space to do it. Um, that would increase our capacity and we could allow more students. What I would wanna make sure is that if we're doing that, we're doing that based on students who live within our district and are paying taxes within our district and that the board is making that determination um, based on that rationale. And if that leaves us open space at that point, great, but that we're not choosing to add staff because of students who are out of outside of our district. So that's how I built it. If the board wants me to go in a different direction, I'm happy to look at it and run numbers. Um, but essentially, the rest of the calculations a little bit more straightforward. Timber Sage has three sections of each grade level for next year. Um, What we did again for this, if you just do a one to 22, it puts us at 66 students. We reduce that number um, by two students for each um, classroom to allow for those students that are a priority in our policy. And we reduced it by one additional section because or one additional student per section because they house the best one of the um, best program, which is one of our specialized programs for the district which could require us at any point to move a student from another school to Timber Sage. And so we wanted to make sure um, there, there was room. When we finish out that calculation, it puts us well over our capacity over the next few years. 
um, which ultimately means what I'm recommending to you at Timber Sage would be that we don't open any seats. So that's a really quick high level how we got there. Um, what's on the next few slides, um, and I broke it down on the document that, that you have in board docs by grade level and by school, because that's how it's in statute. That's the piece we'll actually post on the website once the district, uh, once the board takes action on it. Um, but currently right now, based on our calculations, we are recommending no open seats at the elementary level. The closest we come to open seats is at the middle school level. And I'm recommending that, that uh, we um, don't open any seats at the middle school level because of our high school capacity issue. If you take middle school students, as they progress up, it will cause us an issue at the high school level until the board is able to look at that um, whole situation and determine what's best for the district. So, Which um, document, like what's the title of the document that you said we have that would be put on the website? So can you exit out just so I can see the, so I was just gonna run through what you have access to. Okay. Um, Maybe making him work a little bit. So you have several documents. Um, the one that's highlighted there right now, the 2024, March 25th is this presentation. If you wanna go back and take a look at it, um, I'm not sure it's the most helpful thing to review. Um, the capacity calculation at the bottom is the Google Sheet for all of the schools. So any school you want to take a look at, it will show you um, their actual numbers based on how they were calculated. And then there are two recommendations here. One of them, the USD 230 capacity determination for K-8. And then there's one a little bit lower on there that is for 912. Those would actually be what will be back on the agenda um, at the next meeting for the board to consider for um, for action. We do have to um, approve by May 1st the number of seats that are open, and then we have a process of making sure they're posted on our website and available to the public um, after that. And part of that is to make sure that depending on the decisions the board makes each year, that we could open our out of district lottery on time and all of those kind of steps as well. So we're trying to take this one step at a time um, and try not to get too far ahead of ourselves. But um, the other piece that's on there that you've asked for in the past is the state statute that governs this. Um, so if that's helpful, it's there as well. Do you have questions or is there information that you would like to see at the next meeting or something you'd like in a different format that would help you in making a decision at the next meeting. I know it's a lot of information to throw at you. I was going to let people ask questions and then I was going to move to what I was going to say. Um, so thank you. Um, you know, the high schools are a limiting factor, obviously, but in my reading of the statute, um, the by statute, we still have to accept these applications, even if we publish all zeros is my reading of the statute. That's my understanding of the statute as well. Okay. And then we would still have to, there's a timeline for receiving them. And there is a timeline still for us to respond to them. Um, and just internal discussions have been, that's not a bad thing for us for a lot of reasons. One of those would be, we could better define what our lottery process is going to look like even if we don't have space, I would recommend that we do kind of a mock lottery and we go through our normal procedures because at some point in the future, we we may have open seats. So getting some of that cleaned up. But yes, I agree with you. Uh, and and my, my other reading of the statute um, is that, you know, say 10 people did submit and for some reason we had a dip or people went, which I don't think will happen, people went running out of the district we could then accept those students. Nothing precludes us from exceeding those capacity numbers as everybody. That would be my understanding as well. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. So thanks. Um, have you had a chance to see what other districts are doing or not really? No, uh, we were talking about this in the back. I think we might be the first to put ours out publicly. 
Um, I have an idea of what our neighbors are going to to do, but I prefer not to speak for them. Uh -huh. um, and I think they're in a very different spot because some of them aren't growing at the same rate we are currently. Uh -huh. um, so they're they're looking at their capacity um, slightly slightly different, uh -huh. but. I think there will be, uh, outside of the capacity piece, there will be some communication pieces that I think we're going to want um, mm -hmm. to do just to help our constituents in making a good, making the best decision for their family. Uh, we've been discussing some of the things related to Keisha. Um, we're still anticipating Keisha holding to um, sitting out of a semester of varsity competition. So there's a there's a few of those kind of things that I think will be important for us just to make sure we're helping our families and making decisions. Um, the part we can't predict is how many families we have that will be interested in enrolling in other other districts. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll just have to kind of watch that piece as we go. What I would tell you as a board is if we see um, something different than what we're anticipating, we could come back for next year and make um, make some additional changes to our procedure and open up more seats. But right now, I think this recommendation um, protects the district based on the growth we're anticipated to see. Are you, um, I haven't gone to the website to see this, but are you anticipating like a big open enrollment information button or something on the website? I'm yeah. So what's there right now, and Landon and I've been talking a lot about it, um, what needs to go out. We've, again, tried to take it one step at a time. Right now, we've really been managing the in-district transfer piece, um, which has gone well from our side of things. We're seeing probably a higher than expected number of in-district transfers, I think, because the form is more available in Skyward and, and people can access it a little bit easier. Um, so that piece closes uh, April 15th. And so we'll work through that, but uh, we'll start to to put a little bit more information out. Like I said, we have to have this information on our website um, by May 1st. So uh, with that, we're still developing our lottery procedures and what that will look like. So all of that we'll want to post as we go. So. Does anybody else have any other yeah, questions? I just want to say kudos to you. This has not been um, easy as legislation came out and it was there was holes everywhere and trying to piece it together and make um, this make sense and make it work for our district. So great job, because I know we all had questions. And then when we went to the state, <laughs> we assumed we would be asking them for clarification and it was opposite, they were asking us. So it's exciting to see um, kind of this come together, this um, and and all the moving pieces kind of be simplified. I I really really love that. I'm I'm eager to hear also because these are pieces that I didn't even think about the Keisha piece mm -hmm. and how we're going to solidify that. And you know, like there's all those pieces that we should probably be able to say, hey, if you're wanting to move look for these, like, hey, here's some caveats to those moves. Knowing some of that stuff would be really great to have in our toolbox. So there's a few pieces that I would put out there publicly. The other thing is this doesn't impact preschool. The, the only way this impacts preschool is if we were to open the lottery and accept an out-of-district student who has a preschool sibling. But right now it's really a K-12 statute. We are also watching, you've got a couple pieces of legislation that um, if I was looking right, the House bill that addresses open enrollment substituted into a Senate bill. Um, I think there's the, they're starting to do some cleanup of this bill, and I would expect you're going to see that over the next couple years, that even as we put our numbers out and other districts do, um, I would assume there will be things that they like about our um, our recommendation, there will be things they don't, and you'll see some legislative changes that we may have to adapt to in the future. Um, but we're watching closely the bills that are there. Um, that probably the biggest thing right now is they're trying to clean up the loophole for families who are out of district and already enrolled here. Uh, we were working off of the understanding that they would stay, and that's I think they're trying to legislatively make that um, put that into statute. So some of the previous wording, there was a disagreement as to whether it started in year two versus um, 
did that not already come out? I thought I'd heard the it's, last week. It's that out of did. committee, if I understood right, but it hasn't gone all the way through yet. I think it will. Um, I think it will make it all the way through, but we're operating that way until we see something differently. Yeah. Thank you. And if you brought, have questions again, if or if it's helpful to come sit down and go through some of that one on one, please let me know. I'm happy to to walk you through it or slow down and talk a little bit slower next time, too. <laughs> you brought up the preschool. I want to make sure even if we accept a student that the preschool doesn't get to the front of the line, because even in district yeah. folks yeah. get waitlisted for that preschool. Yeah, and I think right. you would have to treat them the same way, but it would allow them if there's space available to enroll, which currently our, our expectation has been that they have to live within our um, district. And I only mention it tonight because I think Rachel and I feel that a couple calls already from preschool families from other districts that are looking at this as this might be an opportunity to get into a really good preschool program. So, uh -huh. uh, well, then if if you did happen to accept somebody in the preschool program, does that would that in make you very well could from the whole way through? I mean, yeah. that's where it could get kind of sticky, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what they're thinking, too. So. Every time we discuss it, there's more questions than answers on some of these things. So wow. uh, we'll continue to problem solve wow. through it. But so Thank I appreciate you. the question. Taking a, a ton of time, ton of your time away from us. We've got things. a good team. They've done a nice job in working on this. So anyway, right. thank you. No more questions. Okay. Um, moving on to our last discussion item, which is 9.08 Board of Education meeting schedule for fiscal year 2025. So um, that is up there now. I think the one. Um, thing that we had talked about in the um, agenda review is if anyone would be opposed to starting our meetings at six. Um, Keith, are you still on there? He's gone. Okay. So he's somebody that I thought might, because we used to have several board members that traveled downtown and were commuting and it was hard for them to get here sometimes even by seven. So um, that was kind of one of the um, thoughts that we had. This um, schedule does not, if, could you scroll up just a little bit on it? Um, thank you. We, we would have two meetings in March this year. We'd actually have three meetings in March. So I know we had talked about how that was kind of a long stretch um, in between. And this, so this this schedule mirrors what we're doing this year, correct, Dr. Lickner? Not exactly, because this this mirror goes back to mirroring what we did two in uh, a year ago. Okay. Okay. In the twenty two twenty three, because this one has we normally meet the second and fourth Tuesday. I mean, second and fourth Monday of each month. This here includes a meeting, uh, a, two regular meetings every month, with the exception of. Uh, November because this the fourth month the fourth Monday falls uh, right after Thanksgiving when we're out that entire week prior, which would make it really difficult to get ready and prepare for a meeting. The other one only also has one meeting uh, in December because the fourth Monday, uh, I mean the fourth the, the fourth Monday is like on the twenty third of December, which is we're not in session, which again is right up there too, before with the uh, Christmas Eve and that, and then we also then as typical stayed with it, only have one one meeting in May, which has typically been the case because again the fourth Monday is Memorial Day, and so we basically have twenty one regular meetings, uh, three months. Uh, that includes there's three. If you were having, if you, if you had three in those, you had an extra meeting in those three months of November, de December, and May, you would be 24, which would be two a month. So we're doing 21 regular. We're doing four possible fifth Monday work sessions on top of the 21. And then that 21 regular sessions does include four of the regular sessions being in the AM in the mornings at one of our school sites. So comments. I am I I'm excited to see more meetings in July. This past year we had one and it 
was not enough. Um, there were, I think we even had special meetings because the one isn't enough. So um, I also, I'm not against moving to six. Does that cause any, um, any issue with the other people that come besides us? So our presenters, our staff, is that, is, does that cause any issue? I think for the staff, they'd probably rather because they probably have stayed, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to speak for the staff. So do you want to speak for the staff? Michelle, do you want to speak for the staff? <laughs> Somebody want to speak for the staff? <laughs> uh, I think what you'd hear from staff is that the move from seven o'clock to six o'clock would be a positive. Um, but we could check further if that's something you want to know. But if it's, yeah, if we keep talking longer and we have a longer meeting, it's not a positive. <laughs> if it's so longer, it's just more. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, the idea is that we would get done earlier. That would be the, the goal to not be making decisions late mm -hmm. later at night, I think is the biggest thing. So, um, when do we need to bring this back? Uh, we just can oh, bring it. Oh, John has a question. Well, I, I just kind of have a comment. I mean, just given some of the things that I think that we all know that we're going to come up against this year in discussions, I'll be perfectly honest. I, I think there's not enough work sessions in this. And I, I would, my preference would be to, to have them in there so everybody can have them against their schedule now. And we can always strike them instead of taking the opposing position of, oh, well, we can always add them later because that's been proving difficult for us. Okay. So that would be my comment. How many fourth Monday or fifth Mondays do we have this year? Four? For, for this year, this current? This past? Yeah. We did one in October. And we did one, we have one coming up in April and we only we only did we only had did uh two i think the one i, think there, I think there was three total but i could be wrong but maybe we didn't actually have it because we've done one already yeah and there was the one in october and we've got one oh yeah coming. so there's january three. yeah three so this would be one more yeah I, 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 yes do you want to explain the difference between a work session and a regular meeting? Sure. Um, work session, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, because you probably are thinking you know, and I might not know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, um, the work sessions don't have all your standard agenda items on them. You don't go through the minutes, the payroll and claims, and all that sort of thing. It's more usually geared toward a specific thing that we want to work through as a board, um, or maybe two things. Um, no executive. Well, we have added them though in the past. We weren't supposed to. <laughs> you can't add an executive session to a work session unless you make it a meeting. And I think that's what we did in that particular case. We, we made, made the work meeting. session an official meeting, and then we could add things we wanted to. So they're not considered a formal meeting. They're not considered a formal meeting. So we really the wouldn't even have does, to approve the them. The clerk our... does not have to be there. We, they aren't live streamed usually because we usually sit around a table and and are there, there can or cannot be minutes, however the board decides. But usually it's that you're going after something specific and you're working on and, and it could be two or three things. But in the past, we've done these as town hall meetings, which I don't think would be a bad idea to do one or two of those, especially if we're looking at figuring out what to do with our capacity issues. Um, you don't, oh, Candy doesn't want to do a town hall meeting. <laughs> the thing with the town hall meetings is we we quit doing them because we didn't have very good attend attendance at them. Um, we would go to the trouble of having them and we didn't have anybody show up to participate. And so it was a lot of work for staff to either set up stations or do something to, to explain things. And then they weren't attended very well. So, um, the meeting at the high school is listed at 7 p.m. That, that that's an that's an error. Okay. Uh, we yeah we discussed that it'll be 7 a.m. meeting, just like the other ones at the attendance centers. We we and for the record, Dr. Luttrell rolled his eyes when I brought that to his attention. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Does anybody else have any more input on this? When when do we have to have this schedule approved by? 
for next year? When do we have to have this vote on this, the board meeting schedule? We need to have this in place before the schools start making their activity calendars for next year. So last week. Yeah. So just <laughs> simply because we try to prevent the conflict from school activities and the board meetings. So we're, we're not conflicting board members and parents. Right. So if you have specific um, requests on this, send them to um, Rachel or Dr. Luttrell. And then um, when we bring this back, we can discuss a little bit before we vote on if we need to hash some things out. Does that sound doable? With Did everyone? we agree to six instead of seven? Is that some, is or what more needs to happen so we can do that? I would say maybe if we check with Keith, he's the only one that I thought, because sometimes he's driving back from somewhere. So so I think what we're saying out loud is none of us are saying, no, we can't make six. Is that what we're all saying? I think that's what everybody I'm said here. It. Yeah, okay. too. I'm fine with it. I think it's good, too, as long as we, we don't do just talk about their own. Yeah, I think if we did them before six, it would kind of limit some of the public being able to be here in their general schedule. So um, not that everybody has the nine to five schedule, but a lot do. So, okay. So we will um, work at bringing this back. And that ends our discussion items. We have um, future discussion items. There's a list here. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a carryover from like we. I know we've been trying to clean up some of the items that were on the list that were on this, been brought up in the past, so that we could kind of make sure everybody was working from the same mindset of what has and what has not been brought back. And so I was just given this list of items I knew was on, and so I kind of went through and in read there, kind of put what action in terms of that I know since I've been here that has been taken uh, in relation. Uh, to those in terms of what I could find out what the intent was. There was still a couple there that you don't see something on because I, I still uh, meaning that there really hasn't been anything else done because I'm really not sure of the intent of what the purpose was huh. behind it. So can we get some of them removed? Yes, I think we can. I would say the, the virtual teachers is probably not something we need to have as any kind of a future discussion item. I'm sure that the human resources will bring that. If there's an issue that we're going to need to do that, we'll have to discuss that. Regarding well, maybe this, we could go the other direction. Is there anything on here that anybody wants to keep? <laughs> Just... Student representation, Dr. Luttrell says advisory meets every other month. We had in the past having those students come and present. Right. Is that off the Docket yeah. now. And we and we have again, we have last year as well as this year encouraged that at every meeting and even have had sign up lists and we just cannot get them. They just are so busy. They so I am gonna try, I'm still gonna try to get have at least in the May meeting try to get but it's just it's been like pulling teeth trying to, they they want to, they're just so busy. Well, maybe you know. um, they could come and kind of do a recap of what they've done yes. during the year sort of thing. Oh. Okay. So just to repeat what I think I just heard is none of these items need to remain on this list. Is that what the board is saying? Uh, the only one that I'm thinking of is the cell phone. And I was thinking of that too, because we haven't really heard an update on that. Yeah. yeah and me too. I, I recall that as a patron, right, uh, last fall. And... I don't know. It's maybe something we can put into the next work session to just to spend 10 minutes on real quick. I, a, I want to kind of understand, as I understand it, no cell phones in the in the primaries, uh, none in the middle school, but the high school does uh, allow uh, cell phones, right? A little more complicated than that, I think. Is it? But, yeah. Yeah. Am I oversimplifying it? But Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, I think it'd be okay to have just a report, maybe a staff report on how it's going. Or yeah, I think the board was looking for an end of the year staff report. 
how did this go? Does it need to be changed? Good. Yeah. Thank you, Candy. Yeah, that would be good. So maybe May meeting or even in the one of the summer meetings. So that's that's all I see. I'm not sure what the staff health policy review was about. I don't remember. That, that was the only one I agree. I I think some of these are a little misleading or misinterpreted from what the initial person meant. But yeah, that one I couldn't remember either. Um, evaluation of values. That wasn't, I believe that was Doug, but he, I think he was, it was in relation to when we talk about our small, small town values not our core values. I, I think that's what he was referring to there. I'm not positive. Um, and the only thing I recall, Nicole, too, and again, as a patron, was the teacher training. I think that was centered around uh, just a report to the board uh, related to any activity, any formal activity that's been taking place with uh, the certified staff related to DEI. and So it uh, could just be a list that we get at the beginning and, of the school year, yeah, which it looks like what they're Yeah, doing. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Made available 8 of 23, so just maybe if we could put that on a year, maybe a yearly yeah. um, schedule to see what the professional development training modules are for the next year. I think that would be easy enough for us to see. Um, the one thing that I would maybe ask to add to this list would be, a um, like I think we've talked about before getting a, um, this would be Kylie's purview probably and Tim, but like a, a list of deferred maintenance for all the buildings. Um, I think the there's an organization out there that is making sure that school boards know that they are responsible for um, knowing what's going on as far as what the needs are for each building. And so I think at least having that, not that we're gonna do anything with it, but knowing that that's being prepared and that we would have that available. Would I think that's a fabulous idea. <laughs> oh, you're gonna tell us what's going on? Okay. I am working on a five to 10 year facility plan awesome. for all the schools and I've been getting the principal's input and so we're going to put something together really nice package and we'll present that to you when we got it all finished do you have a idea of when that might be I hope by next school year okay. but I've been working on it for the past six months now so okay yep okay so with this I would say um, if it would be kind of a consensus of the board that we could go through this list in our agenda review. And if you have input on things you want to add or take out, let us know and we'll try and kind of pare it down if if that's okay. But everybody's definitely welcome to put more things on it or input. Are we going to leave it here and kind of do what you just did? Like, hey, could we, like, is that still the so. plan? I okay. think it's a good idea. Don't you just... Yeah, we don't want to belabor it and spend a lot of time on it every meeting, but I think it's good to yeah. have the option. It gives everybody some power to be able to add something in or something. Yeah, I'd just like to see it cleaned up. Like, I feel like we've hit a couple of these several times and we're like, well, we don't need to discuss that. So let's just remove yeah, it and quit discussing it. Yeah, <laughs> and if it's something that's just going to go on our um, board work calendar every year that we want to see this every year, then we can do that. Okay. Okay, so... Um, on to reports, board member, no, board work calendar, speaking of. Um, see where we're at here. Okay, so April 8th, does that look, Dr. Luttrell, is there anything else that we're going to need to, we doing okay that, for that? That's still, I mean, that's, those are pretty much the main, those are very, pretty much the main topics that we will have in terms of for, uh, for our discussion and for our action. Again, we'll update that again after tonight. Uh, but we've been trying to keep that pretty, uh, pretty updated as much as we can as we develop 
our next agenda, but you know, you can knock on action. It may not be as fully because of the fact that, uh, again, after tonight's discussion, all of those items that we had not will move to discussion. So we'll have to update that in the morning because not every time does everything move forward. But, but yes, we're, so we, after, could, yeah, if we could keep this updated so that we can see because it looks like some of these things may be. Well, yeah, and I don't think the watermark gets updated as frequently as. Okay. It, it, as I mean, the, the, the watermark updated. doesn't automatically update. And uh, so. So maybe we just change it. Maybe we can just change the watermark to just say draft yeah. always and the date is because we can look in the revision history when we pull it up. Yeah. Well, and it, yeah. Yeah. That'd, that'd be good. Okay. Anybody have any um, questions or comments about the board work calendar? Okay. Your oh. one page district calendar was supposed to be done March 25th. So that's going to need to be moved down to whenever it because I believe the clerk advised me that you have a committee that will meet on that calendar. That's that one page activity right. calendar. Right. The one that just has all the start date, end date, yes. all the vacations. And so that's not for this coming year, but for the next school year, right? Okay. Yep. So then we'll probably have that as a discussion item at the next meeting or? No, the calendar committee meeting is April 11th, so it'll okay. have to be after that. Okay, okay. Sounds good. Is there a time when we have to have that approved by? Not necessarily? Okay. No. I mean, ideally, it's the sooner the better. Just but yeah, I know in some years, it's been as late as May. Okay. Uh, so, but okay. now, if, it, if we were looking at for this next school year, it would be a problem. But since we're looking, down the road. we're talking 25, 26, but we still want to get that out because people do use that to plan. Right. Okay, so um, Board of Education member reports. Anybody done any site councils or anything? We had spring yeah. break, so. I do, and I'm not, I'm in the spirit of time and the business we've got ahead. Um, sat in on, uh, as the liaison for Spring Hill Rec, uh, have sat in on a board meeting and met with the director on several occasions. And uh, there's just a, a, a host of great things to report uh, that they've done over the winter uh, and uh, things that they're getting ready for spring and summer. One thing I tasked them with out of the discussions that I had with Mr. Peel uh, was related to trying to uh, improve the working relationship. And this is this has nothing to do with Kylie on a personal level as much as it does on the Spring Hill Rec in providing uh, a timely kind of ask of calendar commitments. And so what I asked them to provide me with was a list of what they would like to see for the fall winter uh, of the 24, 25 school year. Uh, and so they've done that. And I told him that I would mention it at this meeting and that will be the trigger then for him to follow up with Kylie and, and start those discussions and get out in front. Because as I understand it in the past, this has been something that was way too late um, and uh, other commitments may have been in front of it or behind it. I don't know, but we're going to just try and get out in front of it uh, so that we can further support Spring Hill Rec. There's some things that Spring Hill Rec has proposed that they can do to support us in some of our efforts, particularly with some of the activities at the high school. So we'll see. Okay. okay. Any other? Oh. Mr. Chitwood. I did. I, I had a site council at Spring Hill Elementary. Um, they are ecstatic about their new playground. Uh, very delighted. Um, one of the, the horns I got to toot is their uh, Leader and Me program. Um, you know, a, a peer accountability program and behavior, behavior uh, intervention program. Uh, and really one of the, the amazing thing was they had a 66% reduction in discipline referrals. 66% wow. across the board, wow. bottom to top. It's amazing. So there's my report. <laughs> Anybody else have any? I did a site council at the Early Learning Center and uh, Miss Barnhill has done an amazing job over there. I was able to tour that facility and see um, they were actually in the process of changing over all the classrooms and 
the teachers really do a great job every Friday flipping the classrooms to a whole new theme, which is crazy to me to think that every week your your kid is walking into a completely different theme in the classroom. Um, one thing that I thought was really cool for these teachers over there is they have professional development now for preschool teachers. They've never had that before. And so they have implemented a couple of programs that they've been able to see a lot of growth um, with the with the kids. And then um, just one other thing they said was everybody that is going on to kindergarten is so excited for kindergarten <laughs> roundup. <laughs> some of this, um, some of the little ones said to their teacher, you know, well, 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 bye, I'll be done after kindergarten roundup. And they're like, well, no, <laughs> you know, we're, you got to come back here, but they're really excited for kindergarten. And um, that facility is, it, it's really nice. And the teachers do a good job. Okay. Anybody else? Board member reports? Okay. Moving on then to superintendent report. Dr. Uh, Littrell. Again, and to be respectful of time, uh, speaking of site councils, one thing that was started this year because of the new uh, KISA cycle that we're in, uh, we also have a uh, district level site council that we open up to people, anybody that wants to come. We had one back in November. We had for what I would say on a weekday afternoon around five o'clock, we, we did have good attendance and we just basically that made at that one in meeting in November, we talked about, you know, our strategic plan uh, and so forth. And then we do those twice a year. Our next one is coming up for next Tuesday, April 2nd, y'all are definitely welcome to attend that. It'll be at 5.15 p.m. at Woodland Spring Middle School. We try to keep those to about an hour. This month's or this meeting's topics, we're going to be uh, sharing with them uh, first and foremost about we want to give them what we showed you all a couple last month where we showed you how awesome our students have been performing on state assessments compared to their peers. And we chose that because we're fixing now to go into the new state assessment season uh, coming up. So we thought uh, that would be, uh, you know, very uh, appropriate, you know, for that. So that's going to be one of the main topics that um, we uh, talk about. And then we also, uh, out of that, as you know, we have coming up next week, uh, for several years, the Board of Education here has made a commitment to try and get, uh, you know, target their horizon in terms of networking with other school board members from not only across the state, but across the country. And so the uh, national conference is coming up in about a week, and we have several members that will be attending that. And I'm sure that when we come back in a future meeting, they'll be telling you about the great things that uh, that they witnessed. That is April the 5th through the 8th. And then, uh, as you know, we've been following our current year funding, which is very critical to our success. We're limited in so many ways because we're always playing catch up. And we got all the way to the finish line last year and it fell short. Uh, we're back at it this year. Uh, we got another week left in the session. I am happy to report that this morning we did that, that as of this afternoon, Senate Bill 386, which is the current year funding bill, did. Uh, have a vote on the Senate floor. It did successfully pass with an amendment that uh, had wording in it that was endorsed by the Kansas Association of School Boards as well as the Kansas uh, School Administrators Association, which is huge. We did not have that specific component last year. Now, there's still some more hurdles that have to be, uh, you know, gotten through, but we're, we're, I'm feeling better, but again, it's still up and down, but, uh, we will continue to communicate with our representatives and senators. Like I said, Senator, I mean, Senator Molly Baumgartner has really been helpful uh, this go around as well as, of course, Representative Thomas. But any of the representatives or senators that we have reached out to or have contacted have been very receptive and they realize the importance of current year funding for growing districts. It's just they also trying to come up with a, a um, format that tries to lessen the blow for districts that are decreasing 
in enrollment, but we should know that status in the next two to three weeks for sure, if not before. Uh, that's my superintendent's report. It's looking favorable. And I do appreciate everyone's help because I know several of you have comment, have at my urging have reached out to our representative, senator, Senate president, represent, uh, speaker of the house. And uh, like I said, I do think that's been uh, been beneficial as they've continued to know and hear of our needs. Okay. Um, we do need two executive sessions tonight. So the first one, how much time do you think we need for the first one? 15 minutes? Yes. 15 yeah. minutes. Okay. So I would entertain a motion. Okay, Madam President, I move uh, that the board go into executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non-elected personnel to protect the privacy and interest and an identifiable individual under coma. Those to be in session include the Board of Education, the Superintendent of School, and Assistant Superintendent of Schools, and Administrators as requested. The executive session is to begin at, do we need a break? Are you, do we need a break? We're maybe five minutes. At 9.45 with the opening meeting resuming at no later than no later than 10? 10 15 okay is there a second i'll second okay it's been moved and seconded please collect the vote mrs baker yes mrs horn yes mr chitwood yes mrs melius yes mrs mitchell yes mr hole yes approved
Ready? Okay, we're back in session. Um, we have an action item. All right, Madam President, I move to approve action item 15.01 as presented. A second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to um, approve action item 15.01 as presented. Is there any discussion? Okay, Rachel, could you collect the vote, please? Mrs. Horn? Yes. Mr. Chitwood? Yes. Mrs. Milius? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Hull? Yes. Mrs. Baker? Yes. Approved. Okay. Um, we need one more executive session, and um, we probably just need about, what do you think, Doug? 10, 15 minutes? 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, Madam President, I move uh, that the board go into executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non-elected personnel to protect the privacy interest of the identifiable individuals under coma. Those in the sessions include the Board of Education. Um, I think, and I think we just need Board of Education in this one. It's not going to be very long. The Board of Education uh, and others as requested. The executive session will begin at 1012 and to end at 1045, no later than 1045. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Seeing no discussion, will you collect the vote? Rachel, please. Mr. Chitwood? Yes. Mrs. Milius? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Hull? Yes. Mrs. Baker? Yes. Mrs. Horn? Yes. Approved. 